Hello and welcome to the Cinema Gold Podcast. I'm your host, Larry Lace. Today we're diving into the latest box office news and our review of the Mighty Ducks Game Changers and the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. First, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Poddex, for sponsoring this episode. Visit poddex.com and use promo code CINEMAGOLD for 10% off your first purchase. Now let's first get into the box office and look at Godzilla vs. Kong making records. In the last couple of weeks, it has been made pretty damn clear that people have sincerely missed going to the movies. For the last year, people have primarily had to feed their film cravings cravings with home video, digital releases, and streaming services. But after an incredibly long year, cinemas are finally beginning to make a comeback, and it seems there are a lot of folks interested in celebrating the occasion. Godzilla vs. Kong has been the primary recipient of this love, as its opening weekend numbers set records for a mid-pandemic release, and it has continued to succeed in its second Friday to Sunday as well. Its domestic haul has helping to boost its global total to an exciting milestone. According to The Hollywood Reporter, Godzilla vs. Kong added an additional $13.4 million to its box office sales this past weekend, meaning that to date it has made $69.5 million here at home. This means that it is now officially the highest grossing domestic release since the start of the pandemic in March 2020. That record was previously held by Christopher Nolan's Tenet, which has now made $57.9 million from ticket sales in North America. And it's now playing over 3,000 locations nationwide, including LA and New York. Those numbers are pretty small when you actually look at what Godzilla vs. Kong is doing abroad, however. The film got a head start internationally, released about a week early in foreign markets, and has been a huge success, combined with $69.5 million from North America. The blockbuster has thus far earned $357.8 million. This means that it is now actually on pace to easily outgross Godzilla the King of the Monsters, which made $386 million worldwide when it played on the big screen in 2019. That in mind, a very important thing to keep in mind while looking at Godzilla vs. Kong's numbers is context. As I've noted, Noted previously, the Monsterverse has hardly proven to be a huge win for Warner Brothers and Legendary Pictures since its inception in 2014 with the release of Godzilla. The movies including Kong Skull Island, in addition to the aforementioned Godzilla King of the Monsters, did decent when they were respectively released, but they hardly demonstrated that the world is begging for more. Godzilla vs. Kong is getting a massive response, but a considerable fraction of its audience most certainly had to consist of people who were just desperate to watch a blockbuster on the big screen. Again, after a long time away from that experience. That is also something important to consider when you look at the movie's day and date release model on HBO Max. People opting to go see the new film in their local theater may suggest on the surface that there can be a totally peaceful coexistence between theatrical and streaming, but it's hard to judge these results because of all the external, unmeasurable factors in play. It's a situation that we likely won't have much clarity until we get into the back half of 2021, which we'll still we'll see Warner Brothers release their full slate the same way. As for the rest of the domestic top 10, this was a box office weekend that obviously saw most of the attention go to Godzilla vs. Kong, but there were five other titles playing that earned north of seven figures. The title that claimed closest to the Monsterverse blockbuster was Nobody, which made an additional $2.7 million in its third week of release. That movie has now made $15.6 million. Though though things may considerably slow down next weekend, given the fact that the action movie will be available on PVOD starting April 16th, part of a deal reached between Universal and AMC Theaters last year. Right behind Nobody in the domestic rankings is the new horror movie The Unholy, which added an additional $2.4 million to its box office sales in North America, which now totals $6.7 million. Just enough money to once again beat out Walt Disney's Ray and the Last Dragon, which has now made $35.2 million. New release... New release-wise, the only title bold enough to arrive on the big screen in the wake of Godzilla vs. Kong was Voyagers, which didn't do so hot. 
The film has been de best described as being a take of Lord of the Flies set in outer space. It began its run in theaters making only 1.4 million in 2,000 locations. It did beat up 1.1 million made by Tim Story's Tom and Jerry, and it secured a place in the top five. The climate is starting to change for movie theaters, and after a long time, it feels like there's a whole lot of optimism about what's coming in the next few months. I'm certainly keeping my fingers crossed that it won't be much longer before everything is back to some sort of normal. And I'll start to release my regular box office column once again. Stay with Cinema Gold for your latest movie news. And now on to The Mighty Ducks. Game Changers review for episode 3. Things go from better to worse, but then slightly better again for the Don't Bothers in the third episode of the Mighty Ducks Game Changers. Evan and his teammates work as a team, but not on the ice. Instead, they make a concerted effort to convince Sophie, Evan's only friend on the Ducks, to join the Don't Bothers. Not surprisingly, Sophie does not want to leave the best team to play for the worst, but Evan is undeterred. Episode 3 also examines the pressure put on kids by their parents and coaches, and in the case of Sophie, the pressure kids put on themselves. The mystery of why Gordon Bombay hates hockey so much is also peeled back a bit, while making the former Minnesota Miracle Man completely 180 his opinion on the sport seems like a cheap plot device at first. Game Changers gives Bombay compelling reasons as to why he no longer likes hockey, but as the title of the series implies, we get the sense that something inside of Bombay is also changing. Nick, the talkative podcaster turned player, gets a chance to shine in this episode in a subplot involving rink attendant Winnie weathering a breakup with her loser boyfriend, Coco Chad. The game between the Don't Bothers and the Ducks culminates in a hockey action sequence that will please fans of the original Ducks movie. But we are quickly pulled back to reality when we see a doc darker side of Coach T, the coach of the Ducks who goes from smug hockey bro to Coach Riley 2.0 when the Ducks play the Don't Bothers. The Mighty Ducks Game Changers is slowly improving as a series, just as the Don't Bothers are slowly improving as a team. The off-ice drama is enjoyable and funny, and there is enough on-ice tomfoolery to make Game Changers start to feel like a worthy extension of Ducks movies. And this week I'm gonna reveal some uh, small Easter eggs, or better yet, let's call them duck eggs. In this episode, there's a framed Minnesota North Star jersey hanging in the snack bar at the Ice Palace. It's kind of strange to see that, given that Gordon has a strong dislike of hockey. Gordon Bombay briefly mentions his friend Jan, who appeared in the 94 movie D2 The Mighty Ducks as Han's brother and co-owner of the local hockey pro shop. A statue of Nordy, the Minnesota Wilds mascot, sits on a shelf in Evan's bedroom. The Ducks players wear purple jerseys, similar to the eggplant colored jersey The Mighty Ducks NHL team wore in the 90s, albeit with a different shade of blue and with a meaner looking Ducks logo. The Don't Bothers give up 17 goals when they play the Ducks in this episode. In the original Mighty Ducks film, the District 5 team also gave up 17 goals when playing the Hawks. And that's our review for the latest episode of Game Changers. Let us know your thoughts about this episode by sending us a tweet at Cinema Gold 2 and leave a comment in the comment section below with your thoughts. Now on to our review of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier episode 4 brings things to a boiling point with Sam, Bucky, John Walker, and the Flag Smashers. The first three episodes of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier are all about world building. The first episode was about what our heroes were up to in a post-blip world. The second episode focused on the new Captain America, John Walker. The third episode was a Captain America the Civil War throwback by revisiting Baron Zemo and Sharon Carter. 
All the while, we check in on the Flag Smashers and get an increased idea of what they're about. While there's something in there about a mysterious evil threat in the background, ready to make a play. Oh, and there's a pissed off Condon bodyguard mixed in there. Episode 4 isn't about introducing new characters or concepts. It's not about visiting new cities or countries that have specific ties to Marvel lore. It's about playing with the ingredients we're giving and seeing what we can make out of it. This doesn't mean that we get an episode that's less than thrilling. It even spins its wheels for a bit, but that doesn't mean that's nothing of note happens. The first half of the episode is about reaching a boiling point between the three main parties existing around our heroes. Three volatile parties that the show has gone to great lengths to portray as sympathetic and likable at times, only to remind us that they aren't as pure as they'd like us to believe. In one corner, you have the accomplished soldier taking Captain America's place who wants to do right by his country, but his shortcomings are starting to build within and it's affecting his attitude. You have the group of revolutionaries whose ultimate goals are noble, but their leader is starting to go off the rails, slipping in, in, into mass murder, understandable as some of her actions may be. And there's the cool and overly competent escape convict slash dancing machine, who has proven his worth to our heroes, but is a bit of a loose cannon, and also murdered a country king several years ago. Sam Wilson has been able to see eye to eye with Walker and Zemo at times. He believes he can see eye to eye with Carly if given the chance. Unfortunately, this strength means nothing when those three are in the same vicinity as it is in their natures to oppose each other. After seeing Sam being a little more than a tag along in the previous episode, it's nice to see him step up here, less as an action hero for more for most uh, episode but more as someone with empathy for his foes, looking for solutions that don't necessarily need super heroic action. Sure, he's more than capable of throwing down with super soldiers, but he doesn't want to. He wants to help people with their trauma and make the world a better place through that. If he could have it his way, he'd convince Carly her, her way was wrong. Zemo would go back into custody, and John Walker would go back on his way to wielding the shield without Sam having to deal with him regularly. It's what he wants, but it isn't what he's going to get. The real person of interest this time around is John Walker. Zemo's story is simple. He's a manipulator who's able to take control of any situation. Carly is someone who feels she's doing the right thing, but keeps feeling that her back is to the wall. Walker acts like he's in Carly's shoes, but it's more of a mix of selfishness and humiliation. Walker went into this story thinking he was the second coming of Rogers, but now he's taking a few shots to the face and no longer knows what he is. There's a quiet moment with Walker talking to Battlestar that really waves a red flag about the choice of having him wield the shield. The second episode talked up his war medals and how empowering they are. But are they really? War is hell, and to gather so many of those medals means Walker has gathered his share of scars. And not all of them are on his skin. These feathers in his cap also qualify as baggage. Bucky seems to be taking the back seat this time around, but we do get a flashback early on to his days in Wakanda, where Sebastian Stan sells the hell out of the character's emotion. Fantastic stuff, though while I understand the use of it here, to tie into Ao's sudden appearance, I feel like it would have been more at home in the previous episode. While not the most must-see episode of the show, it's a good cog in the storyline, and I'm excited to see what's next, if anything. The cliffhanger for this episode blows the other three episodes out of the water. And that image of Walker wielding a bloody shield, while bystanders look on in horror, is a haunting one. Well, that's our episode for today. You can follow us on Twitter at CinemaGold2. Like us on Facebook, just search Cinema Gold Podcast. Share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. And be sure to give us a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. If you want to see more videos, uh, you can go up here, our most recent videos. Thanks, and I'll see you tomorrow.